Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hector Pina, and I use he, him pronouns, and I am the Associate of Students of Highland College Vice President. Welcome to our 20 questions with Dr. John Mosby with ASHC, a part of Thunder Week 2020. Before we begin, I wanted to share some tips to enhance today's program's experience. Uh, ASL interpretation is available and should be visible throughout the presentation. If you cannot see the interpreter, try switching to gallery view in the top right corner of the Zoom window. This program is also being recorded and will be available on the CLS YouTube page in a few days. If you have questions for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature. Click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions. You can add questions at any time. You cannot see or hear our attendees. If, so if you have any technical problems or event questions, use the chat feature. Click on the button, chat button to reach the session host. You're also welcome to use the chat function throughout the program to connect with other attendees. We would also appreciate it if you could check in by using our Google form. The URL is, is being posted in the chat. By checking in, you will help us keep track of how many students we will be serving with these programs and get to know you a little bit more about you. Thank you for your support. And at this time, I would like to introduce you to the rest of our student government team. much for that. Hector. I just wanted to welcome everybody and say thank you for being here. My name is Jarmaine Santos. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm your guys' ASHC president. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kayla Pezzolano. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the speaker of caucus. And we are your student body government team. I also would like to thank real quick our supervisor and advisor, Thomas Bowie, who is our ZJ today, and the rest of our um, CLS and CCI team who came together to make this event possible. Now, before we start our program today, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge all indigenous and first people of the land and the space we occupy. For our community at Highland College, we recognize that we are on occupied Duwamish, Coast Salish, Muckleshoot, and Puyallup lands, and we want to thank all relations and tribes today as we prepare to hold space as a community. We recognize that all of us are joining this conversation from different areas, so we also want to invite you to reflect and thank Indigenous and First People of the land and spaces in which you are coming from. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla, uh, for the land acknowledgement. Today, we have curated questions being answered by Dr. John Mosby. And with that, I will pass it on to Jarmaine. Thank you. I would love to welcome our California native who has dedicated so much of his life to the education system and has had made a home here at a Highline, Dr. Mosby. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, it's after 12. Good afternoon. Happy Monday. Happy first day of uh, fall quarter. Uh, again, I'm John Mosby. I uh, have the honor of being the president of Highland College. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I look forward to uh, getting the questions. Hopefully, I'll make some sense in answering them. <laughs> I feel like a round of applause is in order. I know if we were in person holding this, there would definitely, um, definitely be some clapping hands. If the reactions Absolutely. were there, they'd be going on. But good morning, Dr. Mosby. Good morning, good morning. How was your summer? Summer was good. Uh, summer was very fast. It went by very, very fast. I always say that every year, that it goes by fast. And I feel like this summer was the fastest ever. And it was a little different this year because um, obviously our circumstances are very different. Um, so usually I do a little traveling during the summer, um, try to do some vacations. I didn't really do any, any, any traveling, obviously, for obvious reasons, but uh, it, was, it was good. It's nice to be back and ready to go kind of with the fall. It's just amazing how, fat, how quick it flew by, so. Yeah, so you would think with quarantine that it would go even slower, but I just blink my eyes and here we are back in full quarter. 
Yeah, it, it, at times I feel like, you know, when March, when everything kind of changed, I felt that it's sometimes I feel like it's been like five years, right? And then other times I feel like it's been five days. And I think we were just, our students, our staff and faculty have been preparing for kind of the, you know, the unknown, right? And it just seems like that has um, made things go faster, at least at least for me, I mean, I, I, you know, it's almost October already. I mean, 2020 is going to be over in a couple of months. Thank goodness, in my opinion. Yes. <laughs> but time just goes by fast. So, yeah. And this might be perfect timing for our first question, which is, is there something new that you started to do during quarantine? Any new hobbies, skills? Yeah. So I am not... Uh, I'm not a cook. I can eat like the best of them, but I am not a cook. And um, I bought my house a little over a year ago and it has a pretty good sized kitchen. And for the first like year, I just look at the kitchen every day and I don't really make any food. But what I decided to do was start cooking um, a couple days a week. Um, I mean, like cooking, cooking, not necessarily microwaving things, um, but like cooking. And uh, I'm not a good cook. Um, I'm, I'm doing very basic, simple things, but I'm utilizing the kitchen. Um, so I'm not, you know, eating out all the time and trying to be healthy as best I can. Um, but started cooking a little bit. So we, we shall see. Um, I'm so far really good at making pasta. <laughs> Um, pasta and some salmon. So I've been pretty good with that. Yes, that's one of my favorite go-tos. But I, I try and be simple. I'm realistic. Um, although I am a good cook, I want things to be fast, which is why I've been fighting off a fast food addiction. So I have like the little frozen salmon and just unthaw that, boil pasta real quick and get the jar of sauce and ready to roll. Right, right. I, I feel you, right just trying to do that. I mean, at times I, I uh, well, it's been interesting about, oh, uh, since the pandemic has really kind of started for us, I've given up red meat and I'm now, uh, I do have, I do eat fish um, and I do eat occasional chicken, but red meat, beef, I've given up, which has been really interesting. And, and if you knew, I was a steak person before. Um, and I grew up very much in a meat and potatoes house. So I've been a lot more vegetarian, um, which has been really interesting. My friends that I've grown up with just look at me and just shake their head. They're in shock, you know, but I, uh, I felt better. I felt better actually. Um, and I feel a little bit lighter. So I've been trying to incorporate that in my cooking um, with mixed results, but it's fun, you know, it's fun to try something different and um, I'm learning to have patience with myself and trying to cook. So. Yes. And before a quarantine, we've heard that one of your favorite hobbies was watching movies. So what is your favorite movie? So it's a, it's a tie. It's a great question. So, um, so Dead Poet Society is one of my favorites. That's with Robin Williams. I'm dating myself a little bit. Um, the Shawshank Redemption is probably my all time, all time favorite movie. Um, probably one of the a comedy that I, I mean, there's a lot of movies, but if you've ever heard of a movie called Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion, I can watch, I know, I know, it's, it's, it's been out a while. I, if that is on TV, no matter what I'm doing, I can actually sit and watch it. I've probably seen that movie a hundred, 150 times. Um, I just, I just think it's absolutely, absolutely hysterical. Um, so there's, there's a few, you know, there's some, the movies, but I think, I'm trying to think of like recent, recent movies. And it's interesting. As soon as this is over, I will have, of course, a huge list. But um, 
I don't know. I think, yeah, I'll say Dead Plus Society, uh, Shawshank Redemption, and um, and probably a movie. It was a Stephen. It was based on a Stephen King novel called Misery, years ago, with Kathy Bates and James James Con. Yes. And uh, I saw that in college, and uh, I organized. I had been, I saw the previews and I was just like giddy. And I organized uh, with my friends on my, on my floor, my residence hall. So 32 of us went that night to see it opening night. So um, those are, those are some of my favorites. And the chat box is lighting up over here. So it looks like those are some good movie recommendations. Everybody's saying that they love those movies. I forgot about the chat box being open. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kathy Bates is the queen. Yes, yes. There's some great, yeah. Some, there's some really great, there's some really great movies out there. And there's a whole bunch of others too that, um, you know, have messages. But sometimes I want a comedy. Sometimes I don't want to think. Sometimes I just want to laugh. Um, sometimes I, I want to get in my feelings, right? So, um, it really kind of just depends, but those are those are some uh, some favorite ones. Um, and I have a I'm trying to think what's on my Netflix now. Um, actually, I haven't watched Netflix in a while, but there's there's some movies there's some movies on there. And I'm a big uh, I will say huge uh, Marvel person, huge Marvel. So. Um, all those movies, Captain Captain Marvel, um, uh, the the Avengers, um, uh, of course. Oh, I can't believe I didn't even mention this one. I'm so sorry. So I'm all over the place. Um, Black Panther. That's one of my all time favorite movies. Yeah, I saw it four times in the first weekend. I saw it Friday night, twice on Saturday, and one on Sunday. And then I have in my house a big photo of Chadwick, rest in peace. So can't even believe I forgot that. So I, I feel like I should be punished for that. So um, big, and that movie was really special to me for many reasons. It was just, it was wonderful to see a movie that had someone that looked like me that could be a superhero, right? And, and it was so well done. It was beautiful, in my opinion, it was beautiful. It had a great message. It was positive. Um, it was just, it was just nice because not, you know, for many, for many folks, and for in particular for pe many people of color, the portrayals sometimes on TV are not always the, the best and the most positive. So, anyway. Yes, representation matters. <laughs> I definitely feel you on that one. I'd have to say one of my favorite movies actually is a. Chadwick movie as well. It's The Five Bloods on uh -huh. Netflix. Mm -hmm. I have and not. That, I felt like I couldn't hear you. What was that? I said I did not see it, but please go ahead. Yes. 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 Please do. I think it was um, Spike Lee was the director. But, like it was beautifully written, and it just highlighted highlighted a lot of um, important topics that you don't really see portrayed in a movie and especially within the black community. So that, that was a great one. That's good. Okay, I'll have to add that to my list. Aisha said anything Spike Lee is good. Yes, that is for sure. Black Klansman, I just remember that. Um, I had to see it twice because I, I, I was, my mouth was on the ground when I watched. That was the last, I think, Spike Lee movie I saw. And I had to see it again. And I don't usually see movies again, so. Um, but if I see it again, it, it, it really means something, so. Now, so our next question isn't as easy. <laughs> okay, I know. Uh -oh. So what are your thoughts on online learning? You know, that's an excellent question. Um, and I'll tell you, last year, I, I think part of my, my opinion on online learning has maybe changed a little bit or shifted um, when I was a student. So I thought about myself when I was a student and when I, all my classes were in person, it never was online. 
So I never got to experience that. I think that um, we've obviously had a shift to remote learning um, because of the pandemic. Um, and I think that has brought a lot of challenges for our students, for our staff and our faculty. For our students, because you've had to overnight change how you've learned. Because if you wanted to go to an online college, you would have went to an online college, right? But for our faculty and our staff having, I mean, this would have been in person, right? This would have been in person. So um, all of you who've been doing a great job and all the staff have really had to shift all the programming to being virtual. And for our faculty, and that's not easy. And for our faculty that had to now all of a sudden, those who weren't teaching online, who now have to teach in this virtual format, it's just, it's just a big adjustment. Um, I feel that we're learning how to be better, but we still have some work to do. Um, but we have to do the best we can because our students deserve it. And our students, regardless of if we're in person or we're online, our students deserve to get a good solid education. So we're constantly working to make sure that that happens and we're learning along the way. One thing that's different this year for me is that I'm actually teaching a doctoral class at San Francisco State University this year. And uh, uh, it's the first time I've taught in a couple of years, um, but this is the first time I've ever taught online. So I have 16 students in this co their first cohort and it's amazing opportunity, but everything I've learned, I've had to change completely. So it has been a learning experience for me on the other side now. So I'm trying to teach a class. So now we have, you know, it's a four hour class every other Saturday. So I can't lecture for four hours, right? I sh shouldn't lecture four hours anyway, but we have to break it up. We have to make sure we have breaks. I don't require students to have their cameras on because I, I feel like you can learn and your camera can be off. I, I, so that's my opinion. But um, it has been a complete change. Um, so I'm learning a lot and I think that has been helping me when I work with our staff and faculty on how to make this environment the best possible one for our students to get an education. Um, it's been very humbling. So um, I've learned a lot. Um, I recognize now that it's even more so, so much more challenging. Um, and I applaud our students and our staff and faculty for for putting in this work. But I look forward to the opportunity when students have a choice and staff and faculty have a choice between face-to-face -face and between online. Yes, thank you for that. And maybe we'll see um, more people taking virtual classes once we, once we get back on campus. Maybe it'll be somebody will learn that that's their new preference and they do better in a, a virtual learning environment. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you for the, the insight. It definitely is a learning curve for everybody, both, you know, the teachers, the staff, and the students. And that leads me on to the next question that we have for you, which is, uh, what are your, what's your mindset going into budget cuts this year, since we know that we aren't getting as much money because of what's been going on? Budget has been, um, I will say, probably the this year in particular, this past year, or this past seven, eight months, probably for me has been the most challenging uh, time in higher education for me in my career in 26 years. Um, and that includes working in higher education during 9-11, which was, which was pretty tough. Um, Budget, you know, we are, we are, 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 we have budget challenges, not just at our college, but in our system and in, in a state and in the country. And um, it is an extremely difficult, um, extremely difficult kind of position to be in for our entire institution because we are trying to make decisions. We're trying to, to, to be sustainable as an institution. You're trying to be healthy financially. Um, and we have to make some decisions 
and some of them might result in a lower budget in particular areas. But what we're trying to do at the same time is not compromise the services or experience of students. And that's very tough to do because um, that's not what any of us wants to do. You know, we want to be able to provide wonderful opportunities for our students, um, but we have to have staff and faculty and services to do it. So when the state tells us we have to, we have to plan on a cut, it has been very difficult um, to do that because you don't want to cut anything, right? You don't want to cut anything. And you have to have, we, we've had people on our campus, um, on our budget advisory council, our executive cabinet, and then within all the departments on campus, staff and faculty have all had to strategize about what they can and can't do what can be you know, taken off the top in their budgets. Um, and it's a very tough, challenging exercise, but the college I think has done an admirable job of trying to make these decisions with our students and college's best needs in mind. Um, I look at other colleges in our system and they, some, you know, I have some colleagues at other colleges that have even more, I mean, significant budget cuts that were in place before COVID. And I say that not as, because not as we should, we should be like happy about that. It's not about that at all, but every college is affected somehow um, and at some level. And, you know, my hope is that, you know, in the next, we have a couple of years of some struggles, um, but I hope that things will get better and I hope that we will, the plan, the decisions we're making now will help us continue um, to be financially sufficient as we move forward. Um, but I think it's important that our students know and understand what's going on um, and can provide input as well. Um, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and it's tough this year because we're not on campus, right? Many of us are not on campus. So it's hard to kind of see all that what's going on. You'll get an email and you'll get information, but it's hard to sometimes put that, kind of visually see that because we're in our, you know, homes or spaces, we're in our spaces where we're, we're zooming it up, right? Um, but I feel, I feel good about, I, well, I feel comfortable about moving forward. Um, it's just not an easy place to be in. I, I, I've talked to many folks on campus and, you know, there's things that keep me up awake at night and budget is one of them. Because no decision and no answer is a perfect one. But I appreciate the question. Yeah, thank you so much for being real with us. You know, we do know that budget cuts are a big thing and they do affect us, but it's really nice to know that um, the school is trying to put the students first in everything, especially the budget cuts. And, you know, just like Dr. Mozu was saying, if any of the students in the audience have any requests or anything they want us to keep in mind for budget cuts, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, but the next question that we have for you is, uh, what can students expect this fall knowing that, you know, it's online classes and a lot of us haven't had any experience with this environment before? So President Santos, I would say just going back to that last thing before I answer this question, I also will say that this year I will have some, uh, uh, some uh, virtual forms and some open office hours for students so students can zoom on or they can email me or we can talk on the phone and that's an opportunity to hear from students students can provide any kind of information let me know what's working what's not working um, information will be sent out to, to our students about when those times are available so i just want to make sure i before i forget to say that because um, it's always important for me to hear from students um, because we're here for students. Um, so in terms of 
uh, and I want to make sure I answer your understand your question. So in terms of what to expect this year for a lot of for a lot of students, well, I would say first and foremost, you're going to expect or see just some wonderful care from our staff and faculty. We have, you know, I'm, I'm a little biased. I do think Highline's the best, I'll just be honest, but I've worked at many institutions and I do feel, and I just look at the, the group here, um, we have some of the most talented staff and faculty who really, really care and who give such, such, time, such their time, more time than they claim uh, for the campus and for the students. So for our students, they're gonna see that. I'm not saying that every experience is gonna be perfect by any means, um, but you're gonna see, I think, a high caliber of folks who really care. Um, and that's gonna come through in this virtual format. It's different, obviously, because we're not on campus. And if you were on campus, you would visually, I guess, in some ways see that or just be there. Um, but, but I think, I hope that you're gonna be able to experience that this year. Also, uh, there's gonna be a lot of programs. Um, Highland, isn't gonna, Highland isn't stopping the machine, the educational machine, because we're in this virtual format. We're gonna continue to be excellent. We're gonna to continue to provide amazing opportunities. We had a great week last week as we gathered people back on campus. We had some great speakers. We're, it, this week is packed with things. I, you know, I look from everything I look forward to on Friday, I know the drive-in um, pantry, which I get to be a part of um, for um, part of the day. Um, I think people are going to experience a, a, a great opportunity and a great experience. However, if students, you know, we understand that that every student, I understand that every student is, it's, you know, these are challenging times. And students have a lot going on, not just classes. You know, our students have, many of them have jobs, many of them have multiple jobs. Many of them are pay, have bills to pay. Um, many of their students have family members or friends who they have experienced these COVID challenges. Um, so we have opportunities for students. We have counseling services where people can talk. Um, it's a tough time and it's a tough, you know, I'm, I'm a president, I'm 48 years old, 48 and a half, you know, and I still struggle with things, right? And this has been a challenging year, you know. Um, it, you know, I'll just say it, even though some people know, but I lost my dad a month ago. And I was, you know, with my, I was just with my family over the weekend, I just flew back. And it came as a complete shock. So, you know, this campus though, for me, I will say just quickly, was so, is so welcoming and I've received like a hundred cards and texts and phone calls and everything else, people really do care more than I ever imagined. And in a time of budget crunch, crunch, in a time of COVID, in a time of a lot of challenges that people are facing professionally and personally, um, that I still felt an, a ridiculous amount of love from this campus. And I hope that you students feel that way as well. Um, cause this place really does care. So you're going to see that and experience that. And if you're not, and if you feel like we could be better or you're not getting what you need, then you have to tell us and we're gonna, and we're gonna listen. I got it. I always say I got an ego in some things. I don't have an ego in everything. Um, but it's important to hear what, you know, what, what's working and what we can be doing for students. So I, I hope that that foundation students will be able to see and embrace this year or feel, I should say, feel and embrace this year. Uh, thank you. First, I want to say from the ASHC team, you know, we're sorry for your loss. We know that that's really hard, especially during this time. And we thank you for still trying to be a good leader for our college and you're doing a really good job. So thank you for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But. Yeah, I mean, echoing what you said, I love our staff, especially um, since now I get to work a little bit closer with them. They really are loving and they really do care about the students. And it's nice to hear that 
even though we're going through these tough times, that the Highline College doesn't compromise on any of its values and we still try to provide good resources for the students, like counseling, like you mentioned. And um, kind of to follow up that question, our next question is, uh, what are your thoughts regarding the upcoming winter quarter and whether or not it will be online, hybrid, or in person, which I know this is a little hard to answer because we're going by like day-to-day -day stuff, but uh, just for our students, what do you think is going to happen? So today is, no, it's a very good question, a very fair question. Today is the 28th of September, and um, I've given um, our campus or our executive cabinet a goal, a timeline, of November 1st. So by November 1st, at the latest, we will inform the campus of what will happen in winter. Yeah. But you're right, we're looking at, you said the data and day to day, um, but we need to make sure that our faculty, our staff, and our students know well in advance because people have to prepare for that. And if we do go back to being open in some shape or fashion, um, and I'm saying if we were to do that, then what does that mean? Does that mean for departments, certain departments open? And then however, whatever we do, we need to communicate to campus and be very clear. So we're gonna take the month of October to streamline that. So when November comes, we will have, make sure by November 1st, we have a message to campus. Thank you for that information. And I love the transparency that we're giving to the students in the campus. Absolutely, yeah, that's one of the things I appreciate about Dr. Mosby is he's very transparent on things here. Um, but next, we're gonna be moving on to what we call a lightning round. And essentially what it will be, Dr. Mosby, is uh, we will give you a couple seconds between about 20 to 30 seconds to answer each question. Uh, and, and for the audience, I would say if you want to participate, uh, go ahead in the chat box, answer the questions um, that we're gonna be asking Dr. Mosby and just you know, share what your likes and dislikes are. So you ready, Dr. Mosby? Yes, I'm a little nervous, but yes, yes. <laughs> All right, you got this, you got this. All right, perfect. So first question is, what is your favorite nonfiction book? Oh. Um, Just from like the top of your mind. Oh my goodness. Um, Go Tell It on the Mountain from James Baldwin. Ooh, ooh, that's a nice one. And then, uh, let's see here. I actually don't have a nonfiction book, do I? No. Uh, for the next question, what is your favorite fiction book? Oh, um, same one, but you know, a little different. Yeah. This is my favorite fiction book. Oh, um, oh my goodness, I'm drawing a blank. What's yours? I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna put you on the spot. What's yours? Oh man, I, I did not see the turntables on this one. Actually, I should have seen it coming, actually. Uh, my favorite fiction book, man, it's actually, it's, it's been a while since I actually read anything that, that's worth sharing. I am also drawing a blank here. So, uh, I mean, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jermaine. The Martian Chronicles, that one's good. Ooh. Martian Chronicles. I think I'm gonna have to skip this one. I won't skip anymore. I'm really like at a blank, it's so, I haven't read a whole bunch of fiction books lately, though. That's the thing. Um, but now I got to. So, okay. That's my yeah. one pass. That's my one, my one pass. Your one pass. Okay. We'll come back to it a little time once you figure out a little bit more of what, what you wanted to pick here. The next question is, what was your favorite subject you took in school? Oh, English. I was an English major. Loved English. English? Yeah. Oh, man. Love it. I think my, love it, love I think it. my favorite would be... Uh, chemistry. Oh, I love, I love science. I love Ooh. everything that had to do with it. Like, yeah, uh, science and I um, we weren't the best of friends. Um, I will I will say that uh, I, I had I hung out with a lot of uh, 
had a lot of friends who were who were in the sciences. So, um, and I was English, and they would always they would always tease me because they're like, "Oh, you're not business, or you're not science." Yet when their papers were due, yeah, they, you're like, mm. they came to me for it. Yeah, yeah, so I, I, my favorite subject. I feel that. Um, next question, and that is. Have you ever taken classes at Highland College before? No, um, not yet. But there are a couple of classes, like the continuing ed or different things that I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind taking. So I, I think in some at some time, I probably will. Sometime in the future, in your future, possibly. And then for the next one, let's see here. What's the career highlight that you've that you're most proud of? I think, you know, there's two. I, so I've always wanted to be, I wanted to be a president of a college when I was in college, when I was an undergrad. And um, I had decided when I was 21 that I wanted to be a president. And I had set a goal of, being president by by the time I was 50. I don't know why I said 50, but anyway. <laughs> Your head. But I I that was my goal. Um so I'm really I'm probably the most proud of that. I think followed by um well there's three things. So there's that there's um that I've been I'm the first president of color in the history of Highland College. That means a lot to me. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, yeah, it's a big thing for me. And then um, I was an Aspen Presidential Fellow, so I was part of the Aspen program, and um, that was to prepare people to be presidents, and I was one of 38 in the country selected. And uh, so I was very pleased and very proud of that, and I still keep in contact with many folks from that program. Um, so I guess those are my, professionally my, my uh, things I'm most proud of. Your highlights. Oh, those are very impressive highlights, Dr. Mosley. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, saying that you're going to be president since like the age of 21, right? You said? 21, 22, yeah. Oh, 21, 22. Oof, man. I mean, I'm 25. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, in <college. laughs> I'm in college though. Did you reach your goal of making president by 50? Maybe, I don't know if you want to hint at your age by answering oh, yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I became president, I'm 48, I became president 46. So. Oh, okay, so you just crushed it. Yeah. <laughs> Four years ahead. Four years ahead. I, I, um, I always knew I wanted to be in education. I've only worked in education as a professional. Um, it was something that I felt that I loved and I just had good mentors and I actually felt like I was good at it. I needed to learn and grow and I still do, you know, but I just felt there's, there's nothing better than to be a part of a college campus. There's nothing, nothing more energetic, nothing more exciting. Um, I've never worked so hard in my entire life, but it's, there's nothing better than that feeling to just be a part of a college. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then for the next question here, uh, I see kind of a little bit of an odd one here, but do you sleep with a top sheet? Why or why not? <laughs> That's actually an, I don't know who asked that question. That is awesome. Uh, I do, I do. And let me tell you why. So uh, I'm always, if people who know, they always, if, well, when you see me on campus, I usually have a coat or sweater on. I'm always cold. If you think about your friend or your family member who's always cold, I'm that person. I'm that one who's always, it'll be 90 degrees out. Well, that's a little exaggerated, but it'll be like 85 degrees and I will have something on. And um, in my office, I, I have like a little blanket in my, in my office on campus, in my home office, I have a little blanket. I had a hoodie on right before this meeting or before this, before this. Um, I'm always freezing and uh, I've always been cold. So as a result, I have like the, I have like 
two sheets <laughs> and a comforter. <laughs> two sheets and a comforter? Oh man. I do. It's it's bad. And and you would think that I'm like <laughs> literally literally freezing and I I am. So definitely top sheet. If I don't have a top sheet, it must be like a hundred a hundred degrees. But I yeah, top sheet is definitely what we're Oh man, for me, I, I, at least during for the summertime, I've only been saving up like one, just thin blanket. That's enough to keep me warm for the night, kind of thing. Unless it's like drops down to like fifty five or something, but then, <laughs> then I'll probably add an extra layer. But let's see, next question here, and this one might take a little bit of time to think about here. But what is what's on your bucket list? Like, what do you have in mind that you want to do? before it gets to that time? Bucket list. Any travel, uh, yeah. anything like that? So I'm a big tennis fan. Um, I used to play tennis. Um, I haven't played in a while. So I'd like to visit all four of the Grand Slams. And I visited one. So I visited the, the New York one, US Open, but I have not done Wimbledon, the French or the Australian. So I would really like to uh, do that. Um, I also like to go, and I will do this probably the next few years, but I would like to go to Africa um, and just travel. And I, I probably will in the next couple of years because I think we're going to do some, some more uh, uh, agreements with our in some international uh, programming. So I actually definitely feel like that will be the case. Um, and then, um, I mean, those, those are, those are in, um, you know, I want to uh, act in a play or something. When I was younger, I acted um, when I was a kid. And in early college, I was in a couple of plays. And uh, I just like to do a little theater work. I don't know when that'll be, but it won't be anytime soon. Um, and I don't necessarily know what I'd, I'd play, um, but I definitely like to see myself in that. Do 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 something like that. Not trying to win an Oscar or an Emmy, although I have dreams of it all the time. Um, I uh, I would love to to do that. Uh, you know, I so uh, an actor, Mahershala Ali. He's won a couple of Oscars. He was in Green Book. Um, he's just signed for Blade. He's an amazing, amazing actor. I went to college with him and I'm a year older than him. And uh, I used to always think about, <laughs> in my dreams, acting in these movies and winning these Oscars and, you know, uh, being like the next Denzel or something like that. So, and I used to, I used to be like a nickname. Uh, but that, that's, that's a little bit on the bucket list. Yeah. That sounds like a good bucket list. When you mentioned Africa, in my mind, I immediately thought South Africa, and in South Africa, they have um, like these tour guides of uh, you get in a cage and you get submerged in the water and around you are just like these huge, you know, great right sharks, right? And all that is between you is just this bars of, or this metal bars between you and like the, the great right shark. So one of the things that I wanted to do is be put in one of those cages because for me, I, I'm in a, I'm an adventure seeker, so I just want to feel and just have it on my list of done um, mm -hmm. to do that. So hopefully I get to do that sometime later. That'll be next great. Next couple of years. That'll be great. And then the last. I've got a plane before oh. you'd catch me in a cage with some sharks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So moving on to the next one here. Actually, yeah, so this is where. Out of the five senses we have, okay. what is one sense you keep over the others and why? Hmm. 
I think hearing. Hearing. I, I just appreciate the sounds that are made. I appreciate hearing my family and my friends. I appreciate music. I'm a big, big, I love music. I love music. I'm actually surprised there's no music questions so far. Um, maybe that's good because I don't want to embarrass myself with some of the stuff I listen to. But, um, but I, I love the sounds of like running water, nature. I just feel like without that, because if I don't have, well, if I, if I have that sound, if I, if I can hear that, then I still feel like I'm connected and I can just still feel to be a part of something. Um, maybe that's probably the one out of anything. Smell, I'd be, I'd be like, eh, but just the sound um, would be big for me. Sound, hearing, for me, it'll be uh, taste. I want to keep my taste. I love food, right? I want to taste the food that I eat you know the tacos or the uh the indian food that i would eat kind of thing you know so for me it would be it would be taste and then i'm gonna pass it on to Jarmaine. Okay, thank you for that speed round. I think that we didn't really, we didn't exactly keep it to 20, 30 seconds per question, but we learned no. a lot. <laughs> and that's, that's what that is. We had fun. Um, so our next question is, over the summer, uh, you sent out a really powerful and heartfelt email titled, Your Black Colleagues May Look Like They're Okay, Chances Are They're Not. Uh, building on that, is there a message you'd like to send to BIPOC students, which is Black, Indigenous, people of color, faculty, and allies? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's interesting you bring that up now um, because last week um, there was a, a session for guarding enrollment and budget. And before we really delve into that presentation, um, I talked a little bit about checking in on your, checking in on your colleagues and checking in on people. And that was right after um, the district attorney, the uh, Kentucky district attorney made the decision about who to charge or what to charge regarding Brown and Taylor. And regardless of if people, I guess I would say, I, I have my opinion about it. And, and I know other people do as well, but I think my message and my concern that I had was to check in on folks because people are struggling. You know, people are on Zoom, people are still sending emails, people are calling, people are on the phone, people are going about their day. A lot of people are, and a lot of people aren't. They're stressed out, they're upset, they're scared. Um, you got to check in on them. And the strong ones need to be checked in on. The ones who are quiet need to be checked in on. The ones who you haven't heard from need to be checked in on. Um, doesn't make a difference if you're the president, doesn't make the difference if you're this, if you're that. People are really struggling. And regardless if you agree with the decision or not agree with the decision, you still need to check in with your colleagues. If we're an institution that, that promotes and believes in leading with racial equity and inclusion and creating spaces of comfort and care, then we still need to check in with our with our colleagues we need to check in with our students we need to check in with our staff and faculty because these decisions and the decisions that are going on currently in our country are going to play out in the classroom they're going to play out in zoom they're going to play out in our students lives they're going to play out in our staff and our faculty's lives um, so you know my message was and still is to continue being with one another talking with one another checking in on one another also, you know, that's it's a responsibility of me to work with the campus to provide programming, to provide spaces, to have conversations um, so we can continue to move forward as an institution. Um, but we need to call it. 
you know, we, what's going on is, is brutal. What's going on for many people is hatred, it's anger. For some people, it's white supremacy. Either way, it's horrible, you know, and it's dividing, and it's a representative of our institution, excuse me, of our country as a whole. So we have to recognize that. We can't sugarcoat it. We have to call it. We have to name it. It needs to be a part of many of our discussions. Um, and again, regardless of where you sit, is it's more about how do we move forward and how do we become better as a country? That is the issue. And we need to have those conversations and we need to be honest with one another. And that means we also have to have very difficult conversations. And while I might feel a certain way, I still, and I'll just, I'll just say, Jermaine, for example, President Santos, you and I might see something differently, right? I still got to hear from you. I can't dismiss you. I can't ignore that. And I'm not saying we see things differently, but I'm just using it for example. And, and I would hope vice versa. You know, we still have to be able to have a conversation and we, we can disagree without being disrespectful, right? The late Ruth Bader Ginsburg talked about that. We can disagree without being disagreeable. You know, there's things that we can do. So, you know, my message is that we, we work together, we communicate, we challenge each other in a respectful, loving way um, but we don't sugarcoat how we're feeling. We, we don't, we're not in the space anymore where we're gonna hide and sugarcoat how we feel. Um, there is a privilege that goes with that and we're done with that privilege. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. I think that, like you said, reaching out to people, um, community support, that's really important It's you know, you don't have to do it alone and you don't have to let other people do it alone either and i really like the point that you brought up of uh, you can be you can disagree with someone without being disrespectful i think it's really important to hear other people's sides even if you don't agree with them and uh in the on the topic of checking in how are you doing with all of this dr mosby Yes. Um, you know, I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm looking to, I, you know, I guess I'm, I, I struggle with it. I think like everybody else, um, like many people, um, I have my moments where it becomes overwhelming and I have my moments where I feel like I have a good handle and control over things. Um, I think I just basically have come to to recognize that I just have to be human and whatever feelings that I do have, I have to embrace them. And if that means that I, you know, am frustrated and I got to cry a little, then I got to cry a little. If that means that I can focus my attentions on trying to do what's best and I have the energy, then I'll do that. I What I said I'm not going to do is disrespect anybody in the process. And that's what I have control over. I have the control, I have the power to do that. I can't control necessarily what's going out outside these doors, but how I act and how I function and how I live, I do have control over. So I'm gonna focus on that to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you for being honest with us and not sugarcoating everything because this is, real, this is a real struggle. Um, I know for me, it's also been mentally exhausting. Um, and yeah, it's nice to know that even though you're the president of the college and you're, you're like, you're leading all of us that you're still a real person and you're feeling real emotions and you're letting yourself feel real emotions. Mm -hmm. I also just for the attendees want to shout out our counseling center. Um, I think can one of my teammates put the link in the chat just for if anybody needs help sorting out what they're feeling, even if it's 
for online classes if you're feeling nervous. I just wanted to put that resource out there before the next question. And um, the next question is, what is one thing you'd like to change about the U.S. educational system? It's, it's a big one, but yeah, what would you change? Well, it is big. I, I think there's many things I'd like to change, but I, I would probably start with the message that we get from our country is that education is so important, right? Education is vital. Education's imperative. Education's this, education's that. Yet we make it so expensive, right? And yes, yeah, some, someone would say, well, John, we do have financial aid. We do. We do. We do. And that's great. But education is more than just what it takes to, to, to pay for classes, right? It's living expenses. It's, you know, it's books. Books have increased 400% over the past 10 years, right? You know, there's so many costs that go with trying to get this education, this Ameri quote unquote American dream. And our students are coming out, you know, you're, you're, you might be at Highland for two years and then you want to transfer, let's say to UW, okay? So you might be taking student loans at Highline here and student loans you might take at UW. So you're gonna, so a lot of students will graduate, I'm just using UW as an example, but students are graduating with high debt and you're starting off your career in debt. And that makes things very challenging, especially in the Seattle area where it's one of the most expensive areas in the country. Right. I moved here from the Bay Area and the Bay Area, I think it might be the most expensive in the country right next to New York. And people are coming out 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars in debt. Well, how do you get an apartment? How do you try to buy a house? How do you get a car? How do you do all this when you're in debt? And then if your job you're getting out of college doesn't even pay, it's less than how much you owe in student loan debt, it just becomes challenging. So we get these conflicting messages from education from our, from our country. We talk about how important it is, and I believe in education, clearly. I believe in education. I believe that it's important. I believe it's vital. But there is a cost to that. And I think that education should, there sh we can make things a little bit less challenging for our students in the process. Now, I know that's easier said than done. I'm not saying that we should make it, for, I don't even know what all that looks like, but there's things that we can, we can do that makes things sometimes uh, a little less challenging. And I think that in education, my last thing with education is I do think that mental health services should be built in education. I think our students, because our staff and faculty folks are, but our students in particular, they're struggling. And mental health tends to always be on the outside of everything. We have all this going on and mental health always is on the outside, yet it affects so many folks within education. And depending on the state, depending on the institution, um, it is necessarily not a priority because our country doesn't see it as a priority. Um, but I see a direct link to education because we have students who are stressed out, students who are have 50, I mean, I feel like they have 50 things going on at the same time. And we're, we're expecting them to be great students and we're expecting them to pay their bills and we're expecting them to be able to do all this. And they're struggling. And then I look at COVID, right? This, this has already compounded things even more. So people, people stress out and anxiety gets the best of them. And, you know, that's the, that's, that's an issue that we need to look at. And I don't think we focus on. And it doesn't mean that people are bad people. It doesn't mean that you're weak. It doesn't, it doesn't mean like that at all, any of those things. It means that people are human and they need help. And that's really, I think, at the core of how we can really um, 
look at education and mental health and how they work together. So I think that's a, that's a huge issue within our educational system. Yeah, I definitely agree. College is expensive. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's a really good point to bring up that mental health that is it's real and people need to take care of themselves and that's not being selfish. And also on your point of college being expensive, I think that also brings up um, problems of accessibility to people who can't afford college to begin with. Um, I think that you mentioned something about there's something that all of us can do or something not all of us can do, but there is something that we could all try doing. Um, and that leads me on to my next question, which is, um, as, as everybody knows, or most people know, there's an upcoming presidential election. And one of our plans as ASHC student government is to do a video series to promote voting awareness. So to get everyone thinking about that, we wanted to ask uh, Dr. Mosby why he vote or why you vote. So what's the reason you vote? I vote because it's my responsibility to vote. Um, I vote because it's also an honor and privilege to vote. You know, I, I think about people who look like me years ago weren't able to vote. They never had a voice and say. And I feel like for me, if I'm not voting, I'm disrespecting them. And that's, you know, that's my, that's my opinion. But I feel like I would be disrespecting the people before me who created the opportunity for me to vote. And I also want to vote because I want to have a voice in how we move forward as a country, right? And regardless of where people sit politically, um, I do think your voice matters. Um, so I look forward to, to voting. Um, I look forward to um, supporting the people that I want to support. Um, but I can't talk, I, you know, I can't make those statements and talk about, you know, President Santos checking in on your colleagues, you know, those, those messages I would send. I can't do that if I'm not going to vote. So if I'm saying that and I'm not voting, that completely conflicts what I'm trying to say. And I feel like if, if, I'm, if I'm going to say part of it, the first half, then I got to do the second half. Yeah, definitely. Um, voting is powerful and it's really good to bring up uh, the historical context of voting and how it's it's a right and it's a privilege to vote. So if you do have the ability to vote, it would be good and good to, you know, use that to share your voice, um, no matter what your opinions are, you know, you, you have the right to, to vote on those opinions and what you believe in. And um, yeah, I want to pass it on to Kayla to ask um, the next set of questions. Yes, so our next question is actually for our student government team. So it was, why did you decide to be a part of the student government? Mm. And I can, I can start by saying for me, it was definitely an opportunity that I have to acknowledge that highlining was a part of putting me in position to where I had the time um, to be able to do this and be engaged with the school. And I also just, um, I also thought it would be a good opportunity to give back to the community. And Highline does have a strong community and that's why I decided to, um, to go to our school. And I wanted to also give back in ways that I have received being a student. Um, yeah, I think my, my reason for 
um, wanting to be on student government is it kind of aligns with what Kayla was saying was that I wanted to give back to my community and I know that Highline has a really diverse community and I really wanted to be a part of that somehow with making sure that they have all of the resources they have and that um, they get civically engaged. Um, those are those are the main reasons that I chose to run. And for me, the reason I am part of the student government is um, well, there's 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 a couple of reasons, but I would say the two big ones would be um, one, like how Jamie was saying, is to give back to the community, right? Um, uh, a little bit about that is that I grew up and I uh, poor, right? So I had to use a lot of the resources that, that my community had offered to get to where I am now, right? So now that I am in a position to give back to my community, that is something that I want to do. Um, and the second thing is um, people empowerment, really. And by that, I mean uh, empowering those, like for example, for voting, right? I want to empower the people that with, with the knowledge of, of how to vote and these are the possible outcomes of, you know, when you vote, right? Um, and just giving them the people, the resources to help them, um, you know, better themselves and to better their community is, would say the, the main reasons why I wanted to, why I'm running for, or why I am part of student government. Good. Okay. Um, and Dr. Mosby, before we go ahead and finish our questions, I do see that there's a common one here in the chat. So the reoccurring recurring theme seems to be what is being done to support our international students. There are a lot of policy changes being made. And with that, what is some advice that you can provide for them? So I did notice I've been kind of glancing at the, the chat and the Q&A. So right now, I'll talk about it from the president's and chancellor's levels in the state. So we are working, um, and I'll talk about what's happening on campus, but we are working um, with our state board and our attorneys to understand in detail um, the recent orders and directives uh, coming from the government regarding international students. Um, it seems to be one after another. Um, which is truly sad and, and upsetting. Um, so we're working to get clarification and then as a system, how do we respond in terms of, do we provide legal action? Do we, do we sue to um, hold, hold the decision? What are we doing as a, as a system? So we're working on that together, presidents and chancellors with our uh, legal counsel within our system. On campus, I'm working, we're working with our ISP program staff um, to again also understand what's going on, but to uh, make sure that our students um, know that they are appreciated, know they valued, know that they belong here. These are, our, you know, I don't care what kind of students you are, your students, our students are students. Um, our ISP is really trying to make sure that uh, we wanna help, we wanna provide as much information as possible, we wanna support. Um, our students um, during this during this time, and we want to support them all all the time. But during this time, when the messages from Washington uh, D.C. Um, that gives the impression that you're not wanted, so we're working working there. Uh, we're trying to do some programming to make sure students understand their rights and their responsibilities. Um, we're we're looking at you know again trying to make sure that. Washington does right by our students because we have a lot of international students within our system. And I would say to our international students, um, continue, to, continue to check in, which I know they do, but continue to check in with the ISP program, with the staff. If there's questions that come up, no question is a bad question. You ask a question, you make sure if, you, if you're not clear on something to get verification. If, if they don't know, we're gonna find out. Um, I, my only, my, I guess my biggest piece of advice is to know that we care for you, know that we love you, know that you are part of our family and you will always be a part of our family. Sometimes it doesn't bring a, a lot of comfort because you see what's going on on a whole different level nationally, 
but just know that Highline's gonna do whatever we can to take care of you, protect it, because you're part of the Highline family. Yes, thank you for that. I hope that um, answers some of your questions. And I know as part of um, the student government body team, one of our main priorities is providing resources for you all. I've seen another um, question in the chat box about COVID and whether Highline um, is going to be providing a course or an overview and strategies for self-care to cope with the challenges during this pandemic. So um, to kind of add on to that, as a team, we want to make sure that um, all of the students, and I know Highline wants to make sure that you guys have all of the resources you need. So those are things that, that we are looking at. I know we, we discussed like possibly doing a, a webinar with some information on COVID and there is a whole section on Highline's website. If um, one of my teammates could go ahead and, and post, post that in the chat box, if you wanna take a look at that, there are resources available now. And Kayla, if I can add to that, I thank you for that. Um, uh, I saw that question come in and I, I forgot who said it. Um, I saw that question come in at the beginning um, and I think that's a great question. I've asked um, our Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Emily Lardner, to communicate with our um, continuing education department uh, to see about creating a class. I know we have initially had conversations about that, but I think there's some opportunities to create a class that can provide that education opportunity regarding uh, COVID. Um, so I would say we kind of hold tight and I think we can look at and see the feasibility of putting that together. And then um, that website that Kara did talk about in terms of um, COVID, um, you know, to always keep checking that. Um, and, you know, can always, there's, an, there's an email address, I believe, on there that you can get information. Or if you have questions, you can get information um, from folks and students are more than welcome to do that. As we update, we'll be providing some updates fairly soon. Um, again, as we get ready for winter quarter, um, we will be sending that directly to students and then we will direct them to the website as well. Thank you, Rachel. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Yes, in that chat box, Rachel went ahead and provided an email, which is ask at highline.edu. And that is the best email to use when asking about asking about COVID-19 related issues. And also, you can always engage with us, um, your ASHC team, your voice is crucial and it's needed. Your engagement is appreciated. So there are, you know, we have committees like Slack, which is, um, so it's part of the student legislative. It's a student legislative committee. So if you guys want to go ahead and join Slack or create clubs and just talk to us at the end of this um, event, we are going to provide an email where you can reach out to, um, to our ASHC team. And then before we go, Dr. Mosby, is there anything that you would like to tell us about yourself? Um, you know, I was, I was looking at some of the questions. Uh, there's a couple, if I could say a couple, there's a couple questions I think would be really, really good. No problem, Amy. Um, before kind of finishing off, um, since past commencement was virtual, is there a chance where there will be an in-person commencement for those students once the pandemic is over? So um, that was a great question. Um, you know, what we did last year is that we asked our students to vote on, we gave some options um, because I didn't want to make a decision. I didn't want a decision to be made for the campus in terms of our student commencement and students not be a part of decision making. Um, some other colleges were doing that and I just, I, I just said we need to figure out, we need our students to give us their their take and we need to do within reality you know realistically what we can do but we had a whole bunch of students um tell us and and it was decided it was almost basically a tie that we would do a virtual one um and then we would hopefully do some type of ceremony later in the year for our students um obviously some students wouldn't be there but we would still do something 
Well, and all that is dependent, of course, on COVID. That depends on how, you know, the cases, how we can open up the campus. I would love to have um, a face-to-face -face commencement again. And I don't, but I can't say at this point if that's going to happen or not. I, I don't really know. We will do everything in our power to make that happen if we can. Um, but it just depends on the cases, how responsible people take it in the state of Washington. I mean, there's a lot of factors that that go into it. I thought the virtual was nice, you know, but obviously nothing beats kind of the, the in person. Um, and we'll do that if we can. But I think that's a that's a good question. We're going to we're going to know more. Um, probably, I'd say early spring, to be quite honest with you. Um, and um, the recent presidential executive order with regards to education and the use of federal dollars to provide DEI training, I think it's a travesty. I just think it's a travesty. I think it's, um, you know, when you look at critical race theory, and all the other theories that are there and things that really speak to just understanding people. Um, it's a direct, my opinion, it's, it's, it's preventing that from happening, right? Um, it's a tough one and we, we have to abide by that unfortunately because that's, that's the directive, um, but it doesn't mean we like it. And um, I think the DEI work is so important. It's so important in our system. It's so important in our campus. Um, at a place like Highline College, DEI work is crucial. It's vital because of the collection and beauty of people that we have here in our campus community. Um, but it's something that we struggle with because it's, it seems to be, and I guess I just ended on this, it seems to be opportunities to prevent people from mattering, prevent people from feeling like they have the space to be themselves. I mean, the great thing about a place like Highline is you have the most diverse college in the state of Washington. You have this collection and in groups of individuals and their experiences. I mean, it's so much that's wonderful about that. There's also some challenges with that, right? We don't fit in a box. We're not that traditional. We're not a traditional place. And I, that's why I love about Highline, right? But these kind of messages, these kinds of executive orders really, really attack the fabric of what makes our institution and higher education as a whole such a wonderful thing. And I'm hoping that change will come. Um, we will obviously abide by things, but we will also be creative in making sure that um, that good work continues regardless. So if we have to be innovative and, you know, do some things that legally, I want to say legally, but do some things that um, won't affect us, but we could still move forward with those, with that, those opportunities for learning, we will do so, but it's, it's very difficult, very challenging, we'll do it. And I think, Kayla, to answer your question, um, you know, I, I, I will say that I really enjoyed this. Um, there's some really, there's some good questions that I think made me really think about things and about myself. And um, I am in many ways kind of that open book. Um, I do appreciate that. And I hope that the students, I hope people enjoyed that uh, a little more. I will say that, um, I am a music fan. I'm a big, 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 big music fan. Um, maybe not today, but maybe at a next event, I will tell you my Mariah Carey Las Vegas concert story. Yeah, that was a little, that was a special moment. Um, good thing it wasn't videotaped, but I'm a, I'm a big R&B person. Uh, I do some hip hop. I mean, I don't, I don't do hip hop, but I listen to some stuff. Um, I'm more the old school because a lot of stuff now I feel like I'm like, ah, I can't really, I can't really get with some of it. But um, there's some interesting things. Um, there's some interesting kind of music out there. But, you know, I'm a I'm an old Whitney. I'm an old uh, Whitney Houston. I'm a little Mariah Carey, little Luther Vandross, 
a little guy, a little Keith Sweat, the old school. Yep, Matthew. There we go. Old school, old school, school right? Doris knows. Yep. Um, there's a whole bunch of good stuff. Um, little baby face, little Tony Braxton. I was I was where I was playing some uh, R and B this morning. So uh, and some old school Tina Turner. Okay, I'll leave you with this note. Every time I go to an interview in my career, even with Highline College, I wake up in the morning and I, I get dressed and I'm, I have my breakfast, everything, but I always play Tina Turner simply the best to get me hyped for the interview. I'm kind of embarrassed to say that, but you all now have me now. Yeah, exactly, Doris, yeah. So not that I think I'm the best by any means, but I do love that song by Tina Turner and, uh, you know, you, you got to get your hype music. You got to get your hype music. So, and I went in there, um, that 13 hour interview at Highland College and I had, I had Tina Turner blasting and, and look where we are now. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. And if I wasn't able, can I ask a favor from folks? And I will stay on. I think, I think Amy and asked me to stay on. If there are questions, folks, that I did not answer, um, can you capture them and I'll make sure I answer them and I can give them to the three of you. And I guess I would say to the students that I'm so excited to work with these amazing leaders and um, please utilize them. Um, and also just understand that everybody, every student is a leader, regardless if you think you are or not, every student is a leader and it really depends on how you exercise your voice. Um, so always be mindful of that, but for, Jermaine, Kayla, and Hector, you have great people that are going to um, represent and advocate for you. And I look forward to working with the team this year. So thank you. Yes, Dr. Mosby, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, those were some easy questions, some hard ones. Um, and I would also like to say that you know, I think we're lucky to have you as our leader for this institution. And with that, thank you everyone for attending our program today. In the chat box, you can find a link for our Thunder Week feedback form. Your feedback is critical in enhancing our programs and we would greatly appreciate your feedback. And a reminder, if you have not checked in when you arrived, please do so before you leave. Also be sure to join us for more Thunder Week events. Tomorrow we have coffee with academic success at 10 o'clock in the morning and then at 1.30 we have peer-to-peer -peer fast talk. You can see um, the rest of the events for the week lined up here and then you can find the full Thunder Week schedule at cls.highline.edu slash thunderweek. We will also include that in the chat box. Also please follow the Center for Leadership and Center for Cultural Inclusive and Excellence on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date on our upcoming programs and learn more about us and your student leaders. And then for our next slide is how to contact your ASHC team, which is Jarmaine, Hector, and myself. And thank you all for attending. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a good fall quarter. Enjoy the first day of your of fall quarter.